to introduce Nick Marshman to everybody. I've said that right, haven't I? Yeah, yeah, He's been doing yeah. an old time and been around for a long time. Since and, uh, the beginning of Truth Juice. Yes, I felt like I'd come home. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'll leave it to you then, Nick. Thank you very much. Over to you. Oh, hi folks. Um, what we're going to be hearing this afternoon is, uh, is the latest of a series of talks in which I um, sustainably look at the work of our ancestors and basically look at it, try to look at it with a different eye from the eye of modernity. And tonight we're going to hear, on the way in, we're going to have a quick, quick look at the, the raw theories of um, geology and the development of Earth and evolution and the evolution of the cosmos. That'll only be a kind of sideways glance because then I want to look at a new model of the cosmos, which is both brand new and very ancient, which springs directly from the myths and legends and tales and stories of all the peoples of the globe. I also want to have a quick look in passing at how the Earth actually moves through space, because that's a bit of an eye-opener. But the main body of the talk is to do with the close approach of planetary bodies to other planetary bodies and the electrical nature of the universe. It's going to be a story that's told in terms of the Bible and many other places from around the world based on the work of uh, a man called Emmanuel Velikovsky. The second half of the talk, after we've looked at this kind of um, basically close passages of planetary sized bodies to the earth in historical times, uh, that's one of, his, uh, one of his biggest heresies is that basically is that things haven't developed steadily his second biggest heresy is that he claims that there is more than inertia and gravity governing the cosmos in which we live and that in fact it's electrically charged the first half of the talk is not exactly a half it tends to run a bit longer than the second half and the second half is designed to be whipped through really quickly so about halfway through when i get to the end of the the kind of velikovsky stuff we'll decide if we want a 15 minute break or whether we want to crack on that'll be entirely up to you so, and I also, I'd like to stick really closely to the notes because as usual with my talks, there's a real density warning on this one. There is shed loads of stuff in here. You will find yourself, because of the length of time involved and just the sheer volume of data, you will tend to find yourself fading in and out. I know from past experience that the information goes in anyway and quite apart from which you'll be able to, this, quite often it's the second time through and all of this stuff, everything from here is going to be available on the internet. So. Uh, if I could have questions at the end rather than during, that would be great. In the meantime, is everybody sitting comfortably? Yeah. Little Anne says it's time to rock and roll. So, I'm sure it's not news to anybody here that there is a war being waged on consciousness. Through the control of ideas and information, men and women are being coerced by means of threats of force and violence to do things they might not otherwise choose to do. It's becoming ever more clear that the tales we're told as myth are in many cases close to fact and that history, his story, is simply a tale told to children. Even the much vaunted objectivity of our science is being persistently called into question and it's often being called into question by science itself. We also know that trauma in young lives and minds can lead to sublimated behaviour in later life. In this presentation, Worlds in Collision in the Electric Universe, investigates a hidden planetary trauma and potentially the sublimation of the behaviour of an entire race of humanity, which is why it's so important that we understand what's been going on here. Our solar system, which has now been very closely examined, is composed of bodies that are different in practically every form we can imagine. They're different size and form. Some of them are gas giants that revolve slowly. Some of them revolve on their side. Some of them are just tiny rocks that spin impossibly fast. Their velocities, their direction and their axes of rotation are all different. Some of them have got moons, some of them have got loads of moons, some of them have got no moons. And even more strangely, some of those moons rotate clockwise, whereas nearly everything in the solar system rotates counterclockwise, with the exception of Venus, in fact. Um, we've got a model of a, an orthodox, uniformitarian, mechanical and electrically neutral model that is always going to have problems explaining all of these variables. You can only have theories that do the job to a certain extent. There's so much variety out there that really the orthodoxy doesn't stand much of a chance. What we have to ask ourselves is whether a more novel, so a more new and a more ancient model can provide us with answers to some of the many questions we've got 
about the arising and development of the solar system that we find ourselves living in. Might it be that within historical time our solar system has shown itself repeatedly and emphatically to be non-uniform, dynamic and electric? It's a matter of emergence, a matter of emergency even. Unfortunately, the word that has been applied to this entire subject is catastrophism. This is one of the things I think that's put people off reading about it. How many people here have heard about catastrophism? We've got a couple. Yeah. And how many people have actually done any research into what it actually means and what the implications are for our current models? That's exactly what I hoped. It is still my feeling that as we work through this story, there are going to be aspects that touch absolutely every single one of your research. Every single one of you is going to be familiar with some of this stuff. And I hope you find it as uh, completely astonishing as I did. And several of my friends for quite a few days afterwards, it has to be said. So, if we look at theories of planetary origin and the, pro the ideas of the provenance and sustenance of all the forces, the motive forces that keep our planetary system working, we're still looking way back at the celestial mechanical theory of Newton. And the dominant theory of the 19th century was that hundreds of millions of years ago, the Sun was a nebulous disk as wide as the orbit as the farthest of the planets. And that through gravitation and compression, something knocked something a bit closer to something else. A globular sun shaped itself in the centre of the disk. And as a result of the increasing compression of the rotating sun, some matter broke away and portions of the solar system material developed into planets. So some of the stuff that came from the sun turned into the planets and the moons that we're living on. The theory further suggests that the sun attracts the planets to a certain extent, but only to a certain extent that there is then a second urge which somehow keeps the planets from falling into the sun. This is like yin and yang. This is exactly what yin and yang is talking about. Balance of forces, one of which attracts and one of which repels, positive and negative. And of course, the balance of these same forces results in settled orbits, eventually. And uh, standard theory acknowledges that ellipse, vastly elliptical orbits to start with turned into closer to circular, though not very close, apart from Venus, as a result of mutual collisions when the solar system was young. And of course, it's a balance of those same form, those same urges, that basically ensure that the moons rotate around the planets, but on a holographically smaller scale. I love this slide because it's got a picture of a giant tree in the middle of it, because there are some serious problems with that basic theory. And the problems are recognised by science as well as by the new science, as it were, by the established science and the new science. Why, as I said, do some of the satellites revolve clockwise? If all of this happened, then the uh, energy that was being transferred would have resulted in something a lot more uniform. Why does Venus rotate so slowly, clockwise, and on an almost perfectly circular orbit? It's also believed that the velocity of the Sun's rotation in those early stages was not adequate, even to enable bands of matter to actually split apart, let alone for the speeds of rotation and kind of orbit that we see to have been achieved. So, as is the way with modern physics and astronomy, what they did was they said, well, there's not enough energy in this system to account for it, so what we've got to do is find more energy. So they came up with the extremely unlikely scenario that at some point in the distant past, a star passed very close by to our star and sucked an enormous amount of solar material out and lobbed it into this huge disk. So it's basically the same theory, um, but it has an extra amount of energy thrown into it by this passing star. Originally, that was called the planetesimal theory, it's now called the tidal theory, but those two, the tidal and the nebula theory between them, are our current orthodox understanding of how the planets came into being. The tidal theory requires a really rapid transition from vapour to liquid to solid, from that moment when everything's sucked out. It requires that everything cools down really quite quickly, and it predicts as a result of that that there will be small drops at the beginning, small drops at the end, and big drops in the middle of the process. So we would expect to see small planets close to the sun, small planets a long way away from the sun, and big planets in the middle. Which of course is largely what we see, but largely is not good enough for a physical scientific theory. And just by looking at this, you can actually see that Uranus is slightly bigger than Neptune. So it shouldn't really be there, but the, a bigger challenge comes from the fact that on, according to this theory, Mars should be at least 10 times the size of Earth, possibly 50 times the size. And in fact, it's got something like a tenth of the mass. The other thing is that the nebula and tidal theories both assume that planets derive from the Sun and both models are, as previously described, electrically neutral and mechanical. 
They insist that only gravity and inertia play a part in the governance of the system in which we find ourselves. This is not the picture that is presented by our myths and our history. Right back as far as Sumer and Babylon, there were quite detailed stories as to how it was that the planets came into existence. They're all expressed in characters and in personalities and the figures of gods. Sometimes they share the names of the planets, but these stories are, are completely global. They're everywhere on the planet and they're detailed. And these myths in history have been modelled by a man called Stan Hall. Hopefully all these, uh, I haven't got a, a handout sheet together yet for this, but hopefully you'll be able to look some of these things up uh, when you get back home. <coughs> Stan Hall is, uh, is kind of a, like a latter-day in, in, um, Indiana Jones, really amazing character. His website's called the Tyus Gold Library. And as a result of his search for this ancient library, which we don't have time to go into, he got involved in a whole load of myths and history that sent him looking myths and history around the rest of the world. And he's, he's defined this thing he calls the Galactricity Model, myths and history of ancient peoples who witnessed and captured for posterity the major creation events. And we're talking of the births and suns that are planar and planets that are generated by absorption, agitation and discharge from charged bodies that are essentially similar to them but larger. And so we can't go through this whole model, but we imagine an initial thing which he's calling the sun. And it gives birth to an original version of Uranus, an original version of Gaia, both of which are really huge. Um, and eventually, uh, there's um, this proto-formative Uranus nears the kind of formative Gaia. And as a result of that attraction and uh, agitation, births huge gas moons and Earth, and then this proto-Uranus approaches proto-Saturn, which in our myths was called Titan. And it's remembered as the first sun and, and the beginning of a golden age. And it's thought that at that point in time, Earth was captured by Platon, Saturn as a moon, which is an entirely conceivable and well-tellable story that we also don't have time for this time now. And then eventually after Saturn was born, um, it, it itself births Typhon, a character from myth which is thought to have been the original form of Jupiter and also Neptune and what are described as a host of crackling comets and they include Mercury, Mars and our moon, all the original versions of those things. So we do have Arcadian and Phrygian myths on Earth that tell of an Earth in which we had no moon and in which Mercury was devastatingly close to this planet. So there are tales, actually written tales and spoken tales that have been written down of these earlier stages and this is the uh, this is the model of the solar system that is presented by our myths and our legends and the very last virgin birth out of all of these planets is venus and in our most recent myths it venus springs from the head of jupiter or later on athena springing from the head of zeus and it is believed by many peoples on the earth and believe me many of them have kept a very close eye on venus that she sprung literally from the body of the planet Jupiter and came roaring straight towards planet Earth. This is a completely different vision from the standard model. It's a system of planets and moons springing into existence from primal points. And each birth changes the mass and charge of the source and it births new mass, charge and movement into the cosmic environment. This is catastrophism. This is, as we shall see at the very end of the talk, this process we're going to look at manifests the most stunning beauty and geometric regularity as seen from Earth, which is an expression of the age that we're in. So we're going to move through a process of complete chaos, and out of the end of it we're going to see the most incredible levels of order. Stan Hall says that the evidence for catastrophism is supported from so many sources. And the fact that this is the case places its neglect, and it has been neglected, look how many of us have heard of it. It places that neglect beyond surprise and into the realm of calculated admission. The prehistory of the Earth and its custodians lies less in what has been said than in what has been silenced. And that's Stan Hall of the TyusGoldLibrary.com. So why this calculated admission? Is this not a question we in Truth Juice are asking ourselves all the time? What is being hidden? What are we not being told? Quite a lot of answers to these questions really lie at the core of this presentation and the, the long decades of work that have gone into doing 
the stuff which I'm able to summarise here. I really do recommend that anybody who's even vaguely interested pick up on some of the links and references because it's all absolutely ripper stuff. Amazing. One of the first and most persistent and thorough heretics in the modern age to set his mind to investigating these questions was Immanuel Vanikovsky, and his basic tenet was that the Earth and other planets had been subject to cosmic catastrophes in historical times, catastrophes that had been recorded in the oral traditions, myths, and legends of the people of the world. This was a major heresy as far as orthodoxy was concerned. And for our purposes, it's not necessary to segregate the records of single world catastrophes, although we'll do a bit of that. It's more important for this talk to establish, firstly, that there were global physical upheavals in historical times, because not many people know that there were. And secondly, that these catastrophes were caused by extraterrestrial agents. And by that, we, of course, mean planetary-sized bodies in proximity to Earth, not little brain aliens, not little brain aliens with big eyes but that is not to preclude the possibilities of little grey aliens with big eyes as well. Here's a picture of the young Vanikovsky, very interesting looking character. The book was published in 1950, Worlds in Collision, extremely popular, 18 impressions between 1950 and 1973, and six of those were in 1951. So he was as popular with the population as he was um, blackballed by his scientific colleagues. He covers two major periods in this. He wrote another book called Ages in Chaos, which deals with the eras beyond this, before this, and in a bit more details with these. The two things he's interested in are a close, um, a close, con very close conjunction between Venus and Earth 3,400 years ago, which is about 1500 BC and coincident with the time of the Exodus in the Bible, and close conjunctions between Venus and Mars and Earth 2,600 years ago, which is seven or six hundred years BC. That's the time of the new prophets, Isaiah, the time of the king Hezekiah and all of that. That's all in well in biblical written time, that is. The stories are all in there. And once you've heard this stuff, the Bible will never read the same. Loads of mysterious and weird shit that's going down in the Bible makes loads of sense in the light of this story. But before we get into his more bizarre claims, I think it's important to recognize that Velikovsky himself used observation and research and reason and use those faculties to predict some vital characteristics of the solar system which were completely unknown in his time and were not to have been confirmed for some decades afterwards. He predicted high levels of hydrocarbons on Venus. He predicted the anomalously high temperature of Venus and not only is Venus anomalously hot and with an anomalously round orbit and an anomalous spin, its temperature is continuing to increase at an anomalously high rate. It's a pretty uncanny thing is our Venus. He predicted radio waves from Jupiter, a completely outrageous suggestion for him to make. But we now know that there's radio waves coming from every single solar source in the entire cosmos. Everything out there is broadcasting its own unique radio signal. And that's recently changed Jupiter. Those signals from Jupiter have recently changed. It is now said to be singing in another octave. If you want to hear a bit more about that, come and see the talk on Sunday. And I'll be looking at what's happening to the cosmos right now. He also predicted, and this is cracking, he predicted a whole load of stuff about the moon. We don't have time to go into any of that, but the moon is the single most anomalous item known to man, in my opinion. And yet he successfully predicted loads of stuff about it. And I personally think that even the one or two wrong connections he made about the moon will eventually be proved to show to be correct. Pioneer and Voyager probes have subsequently verified these and other published predictions. But despite the fact that he was Einstein's mate, and even with the help of the poster child of the modern physics, it was not possible to get Velikovsky's prior rights of discovery recognised. His brethren said, despite the fact that you published all this stuff, and despite the fact that it has now been shown to be true, we are not going to give you any rights on the subject at all. That's peer review, folks. Red in tooth and claw. That's what happened to Velikovsky, and yet he stuck with it for another 40, 50 years, publishing books, talking to audiences, remaining popular. And I'd really like to see a resurgence in popularity for Velikovsky and the people who are inspired by him. Before we look at the story of the um, 12 tribes of Israel and the Exodus, I want to look a little bit, because the, all these planets moving about, it's a pretty shocking story. I myself had this vision of the solar system just traveling through space like a plate, and all spinning around the sun, okay? In order to just sort of break free, uh, to open the neural pathways a little bit, it's very useful to have some idea of how planets and the sun are actually moving through the solar system. 
Okay? So the idea is that every 50 years the sun performs a big loop and a little loop, like that. So we're not necessarily all travelling around the sun. The planets and the sun are travelling around a common centre. What is said is that um, the centre of rotation does not coincide with the sun that is created by all the bodies in the solar system. The solar system revolves exactly around this centre, not around the sun. The sun itself progresses in the succession of small and large loops every 50 or 70 years. We are ourselves situated on what, was what is described by the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as the unfashionable western spiral arm of the galaxy. From the side, the motion of the sun along the western spiral arm of the galaxy looks like a wave, but it is in fact a spiral. Here you can see that the wave amplitude of the movement of the sun along the western spiral arm increases and decreases with the small and large loops described by the motion of the sun. That image has been idealised in this next one, which shows the western spiral arm as a kind of a, a schematic. And what, it, what they've done is, obviously, strictly speaking, there should be a big loop and a little loop and a big loop and a little loop in that otherwise uniform spiral. But I'm sure you get the idea by now. Of course, the um, galaxy itself is spinning counterclockwise, and it also is orbiting something much bigger than it is, and the whole lot is drifting towards a thing called the Great Attractor, buried in the biggest structure seeable from Earth, the Great Centauri Wall. So everything's spinning. But there's the sun in its spiral pattern round the western spiral arm of the galaxy. And there is an impression of how the planets in their turn spin round the sun. It looks like a smooth coil, but as I say, uh, what we're going to see now is a 90 second vision of what is known as the long body of the sun. It's been known for a long time if you get the little wooden books. Uh, if you get a hold of the compact cosmos, you'll see there's a kind of engraving of this. But I think this is the first time it's actually been put onto a, a computer thing. The sun's path in the animation is shown presumably for purposes of the animation as a straight line, because you'd really lose a lot of the beautiful pattern. And man, I really love this bit. This is one of the most exciting things I've seen in a long time. Um, watch especially for these kind of huge sweeping arcs that Pluto makes above and below the ecliptic round the outside of this whole spiral. It's a vortex for planets. And also watch for the outrageous barreling motions of Saturn. It really is outstanding. I haven't got, I'm not plugged into the sounds, unfortunately, so you'll have to just put up with whatever noise the laptop makes. 90 seconds, back with you. I'm going to watch it too. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> what do you reckon? Eh? How many of you imagined it was actually like that? Yeah. Really brilliant. And of course, it doesn't, that doesn't even show the moons orbiting the planets in a similarly boisterous dance. And some of them have got a dozen moons or more. Right? So this vision of spiralling motions of solid bodies through space, coupled with the sun-born model of planets just springing into existence from other bigger entities, bring the visions and experiences of the ancients much closer to the modern mind, thanks to the glories of the internet. Eh? These are visions, as we shall see, that have been investigated and accepted by many classical writers that aren't otherwise known for being 
bonkers. But I'm sure that the textbooks still contain, I dare say, without exception, the same stage gradualist models that I was taught long, long ago as a schoolboy. Um, there we go. There's a tidy summary of geology and planets in, and worlds in collision. The planet Earth has a stony shell, the lithosphere. It consists of igneous rock like granite and basalt with sedimentary rock on top. The igneous rock is the original crust of the Earth. Sedimentary rock is deposited by water. That really made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end when I read it because it's just like exactly what I remember from school. It's what they told me. But at school, I didn't know that all over the planet there's igneous rock over sedimentary rock. I didn't know there were seashells on top of the Himalayas. I didn't know that there were saltwater lakes several thousand feet above sea level in Peru. So when I reread it, I had a different idea about it. See. And then a little slightly longer, a couple of sentences on the actual geological history of um, fossils. It says the mountains are what is left of plateaus eroded by wind and water in a very slow process. Sedimentary rock is the detritus of igneous rock eroded by rain, then carried to the sea and then slowly deposited. Skeletons of birds and land animals in these rocks are presumed to have belonged to animals that waded close to the sea in shallow water, died while wading, and were covered by sediment before fish destroyed the cadavers or the water separated the bones of their skeletons. No widespread catastrophes disrupted this slow and steady progress. Same thing, bang on, just like it was really deja vu from school for me, it's real classical education that I had. But again, when I was taught it at school, I didn't know that stacks of fish and creatures and forests have been found just buried under mounds of rock and then water all over the earth, not just in one place. It's quite clear that huge amounts of stuff have been swept at some point or another and just buried and something new has happened. And this has been known for some time. The conception of world ages brought to their, age by, brought to their end by violent changes in nature is common all over the world. The number of ages is different from people to people, but the idea is absolutely consistent. Here we've got a fine set of uh, bearded geezers. The first one on the left is Aristotle, who taught periodic destruction by fire and inundation alternately. It seems that we actually get fire and inundation, it's just that sometimes there's a bit more fire than water, and other times there's a bit more water than fire. Aristarchus, he claimed that the Earth undergoes two destructions every 2,484 years, which it turns out is a horribly accurate prediction as far as we're concerned. He also maintains that one is a combustion and the other is a damage. And just in case we should um, not take on board the idea that science can forget inconvenient facts, Aristarchus found that, the, um, that we're living on a sphere and that it rotates around the sun, and he found that out some 1,700 years before Galileo was getting into trouble with it for a new idea. Next in line, we've got Hesiod, third in from the left. He's a major source on Greek mythology, on farming, on Greek economics, on their religion, on astronomy and timekeeping. He was no slouch. And he wrote of four generations of men that were destroyed by the wrath of the planetary gods. A story exactly that we will come across from the other side of the world. And he identifies planetary gods as the agencies that are causing this chaos. The last one over there is... Um, Oh, that was Hesiod was the last one. We also, uh, I've got them mixed up somewhere, have you missed one out? And, um, uh, Heraclitus is the second in from the left. He said the world is destroyed by fire every 10,800 years. Also, interestingly, Homer, who was a contemporary of Hesiod, the last of those four, strictly, he recounts in his legends collisions between Athena or Venus, Ares and Mars, Hermes or Mercury and Aphrodite or the Moon in his epic of the Iliad. Um, and whilst he's said to be a contemporary of uh, Hesiod, it's actually a bit difficult to pin him down. Homer seems to have lived rather uncannily over a thousand years or so. So we suspect he's some kind of agglomeration of myth. All of these stories collected up and put into the Iliad, they're all there. Uh, back to Earth, back to more modern times as we move forward in the uh, 18th century, 18th to 19th century, we find Georges Cuvier, the first vertebrate paleontologist, and he was completely impressed by the sequence of geological layers on the Earth, and he spent a lot of time looking at it. Like I say, he invented vertebrate paleontology, so he wasn't. Uh, he also was uh, not not paying attention. And he realised that great catastrophes have repeatedly changed seabeds into continents, and vice versa. And he concluded that catastrophes must have annihilated life in vast areas. And he regarded this as the most important uh, problem and challenge for geology to solve. And he said that. Um, these ideas have haunted, I may, almost, I may almost say have tormented me 
during my researches among fossil bones, and because he was looking down, not up, he had no idea of what the solution was. To bring the story right up to date, this is one of my all-time favourite books. This is a great one to have in your toilet. Science Frontiers, Some Anomalies and Curiosities of Nature. William R. Corliss spent 50 years of his life ploughing his way through peer-reviewed journals looking for published anomalies. Because as you know, until it passes peer review, it doesn't get, it doesn't get published in something like science. And what he then did was he extracted all this anomalous data and published it in 10 volumes, which are based around subjects of human distribution, archaeology, planets and the moon, things like that. But these two, Science Frontiers Volumes 1 and 2, are William Corliss's favourite anomalies. And he quotes on this subject of the Earth's geological history, he said in, um, in an article from Science in 1983, called Suspect Terrains and Continental Growth. There's a quote which says, more and more the continents seem to be pastiches of rocks from far corners of the Earth plastered one atop the other. Specialists have established more than 300 different terrains around the margins of the Pacific alone. Now to put that into some sort of context, your standard geological model allows for say 10 layers or 10 eras. I'm going to use the word layer, but basically 10 different subsections. The second quote from Science Frontiers of Our Interest comes from a slightly less snappily titled uh, item called The Essential Non-Existence of the Evolutionary Uniformitarian Geologic Column, a Quantitative Assessment from the Creation Research Society, Quarterly. <laughs> what? This, yes, this quote's a man called Woodmerap, and he does a load of maps showing just where the ten major geological periods are represented and where they are absent, and the results are <coughs> shocking. According to Woodmerap's assessment, on 65% of the world's surface, five, five eras, five layers, or less, or more, are not there. So 65%'s only got half of the geological model there, and I've actually seen that written elsewhere in more modern reviews. Even more astonishing is that over 20% of the Earth's surface, that's uh, you know, a fifth, there's fewer than four periods in the correct order. So even when there are five periods there, most of them aren't in the right order. Orthodoxy is still sticking to its tail though. Like. Even worse, Woodrap points out that most of the fossils that are used for dating overlap anywhere from a few to all ten periods. Now, we might have cause to give that a little bit of a side glance because it comes from the Creation Research Society quarterly. So it means that it's written by creationists and peer-reviewed by creationists, which casts another interesting light on peer review, does it not? However, Corliss has a very sharp editorial eye, he's an expert on these anomalies and many other things, and he is quoted as saying, the enormity of what is missing is made all too clear by Woodmerap's maps and statistics. So, it is how it is, chaps, and it's still being, that is being enforced as we go on, we're finding more and more that that is true. What is it? Is it 10 geological layers or is it 300 terrains around the Pacific alone? And so we turn to those persistent traditions of upset that are found from Scandinavia to Tibet and China to the Americas to Australia, all over the world, we'll be hearing quite a lot of them. On arrival in the Americas, it's fairly well known that Columbus and Cortez encountered literate people who had books of their own, many of which were following the cycles of Venus, and nearly all of which were burnt by 16th century Dom Dominican priests. I was going to call them Demonican priests. <laughs> <laughs> In Mexico, it's recorded that the ancients knew that before the present day, before the present sky and earth were formed, man was already created and life had manifested itself four times. That is very, very similar to Hesiod, and Hesiod can have known very little of the ancient Maya, or vice versa. We might assume, although of course we shouldn't take it for granted. More specifically for our point, in the history of the empire of Culhuacan in Mexico, it is related that during a cosmic catastrophe of the remote past, the night did not end for a long time. That was my gateway into this 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I read in several sources in myth and in the Bible that at some point the luminaries, the sun and the moon, stood still in the sky. And this is where Velikovsky started getting serious for me. I already spotted similarities between the Maya and the Bible, and I was very interested in this. The stories that are told all around the world are almost certainly coming from common experience. So the first time I came across it was a tale in the Bible that comes from the book of Joshua and it relates that Joshua went up from Gilgal at night and in the early morning he fell upon his enemies unawares at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goes up to Beth Horon. The record tells that as Joshua's enemies fled, great stones were cast from the sky and 
That same day, the sun stood still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. The luminaries stood in the midst of the sky. The Midrashim, which are books of ancient traditions not embodied in the uh, scriptures that everybody gets to read, elaborates this and it says that the sun and the moon stood still for 18 hours. So from sunrise to sunset, the day lasted about 30 hours. There are a lot of other rabbinical texts, there are a lot of other ancient texts from Egypt and from the Holy Land, as currently called, that tell this story. Prolonged day, prolonged night, the luminaries appearing to stand still in the night sky. There's weird shit going on out there now, guys, and it's not much, not much less weird than this stuff. We're dealing with that on Sunday. Bonikowski examines these tales in a lot of detail. Like I say, if you go into the book, it is a ripping yarn. It's very readable. That's why there were six new impressions in the year after it was published. Many, indeed, most of the documents he's quoting that tell of these events are either rare, vanished, or inscrutable to the modern mind, or a mixture of all three. This, however, is not true of the Old Testament. It's been translated completely, untold, into 470 languages, and into a further 2,500 partially. What an amazing number of languages, eh? And apparently that leaves four and a half thousand that it hasn't been translated into at all. Where did all the languages come from? Oh, no. Amazing. Anyway, across those sort of 470 languages, it covers the mass of the world's population. It's read throughout the world. And the story of the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt and the plagues preceding and accompanying it is one of the most often told and best known of biblical traditions. We had a, fray, uh, we had a plague of blood, of frogs, lice, flies, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness and the famous death of the firstborn, echoed so much later in the uh, New Testament, but this is when the ship first hit the fan. For those of you who don't remember, Pharaoh is entreated to release the children of Israel from bondage, and his re repeated refusal results in a series of plagues visited upon the people of Egypt. It is a long, drawn-out process in the Bible between Yahweh and the king. Basically, let my people go. No, I won't. He says, right, take a rain of blood. Take a, you know, a plague of blood across the land. And eventually, when people are whinging loud enough, Pharaoh goes, okay, I'll let them go. So the Lord goes, right, we'll take away the plague of blood. And Pharaoh goes, I've changed my mind. And he goes, right, take a plague of frog, frogs. It takes ages for this process to go on. Velikovsky has a completely different suggestion. He suggests that the whole thing happened in a matter of days, seven days, and that it was as a result of a planetary contact, all an electrical planetary contact with a comet the size of planet Earth. He suggests that in the mid-second millennium, a planet-sized comet that had only recently become part of the solar system, not unreasonable as we've seen earlier, came very close to Earth. And he demonstrates that the account of this can be reconstructed from evidence in a large number of documents worldwide. And like I say, bizarre and outrageous as this seems, he makes a really good fist of this argument in a very detailed and well-referenced book. You can find out where he gets all his quotes from, and quite a lot of it you can then go and look further into. He says that the first evidence of this encounter was a reddening of the Earth's surface by a fine dust of ferruginous pigment. So a kind of iron-based red dust of some sort. In the book, this is a picture of the Yangtze River, which uh, curiously went completely red in the not-too-distant past. I didn't take a note of when it happened. I think it's in the last couple of years. Very red, lots of outrageous pictures of it. In Exodus, it relates that all the water in the river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and the river smelled so foul that the Egyptians found it impossible to drink its water. Balikovsky also hunted down what he was keen to hunt down was an eyewitness account in Egypt, contemporaneous with this. And he found a thing called the Papyrus Ippua. And he's able to read these languages as well, which is useful. And in Ippowa's papyrus, it says the river is blood. I'm, assuming, I'm not going to go into the frogs and the pestilence and the locusts too much. You need to understand that when these things happen, and they've happened a lot, that pestilence of all sorts just arises spontaneously. And in all those, there can be rats, there can be flies, there can be all sorts of things. I was so fired up by the pestilence bit, though, that I went looking on the internet to see, you know, what about modern, you know, modern pestilence, picks and stuff. And I did find several things. The one that really stuck in my mind was that there had only recently been a, an arising of poisonous spiders in a village in India. Thousands of the little buggers. And they bit loads of people, they killed a couple of people. Naturally this was a kind of magnet for arachnophiles from around the world. And not a single one of those spider specialists was able to say what these spiders were. Nobody was able to tell where they came from. Nobody was able to tell where they went to. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting story that but I'm figuring that when all the rivers became rank, the frogs had nowhere to go. 
actually, when you read about the, the uh, plague of frogs in the Bible, it's horrendous. God's really messy there. He says he'll clear them all up, and he doesn't. So when he withdraws the plague of frogs, there's just piles of rotten frogs everywhere. Hideous it is. Manuscript Quiche of the Mire on the other side of the world tells that in the days of a great cataclysm, when the earth quaked and the sun's motion was interrupted, the water in the rivers turned to blood. The Tartars of the Altai Mountains, that's Mongolia, somewhere completely different again. They tell of a time when the blood turns the whole world red. There are many more of these documents quoted in Worlds in Collision. How many of us knew that the plagues of Egypt were a global experience? How many people knew that people were writing about them all over the world? I certainly didn't. I read the Bible loads of times as a young so I was really chuffed by this. The skin of men and animals was irritated by the dust, which caused boils, sickness, and the death of cattle. And I reckon that probably the lice and flies came along with the boils, they quite often do. It says in Exodus, And the hand of the Lord is upon the cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous, very grievous moraine. Interesting that men are not listed in that particular list, but it must have been happening to them as well. And then after the red dust came a fine dust like the ashes of a furnace, and it fell in all the land of Egypt, and then a very grievous hail. I remember the hail. I remember thinking when I was reading through as a youngster, that's why it's kind of inconsistent. It's very damaging hail. Um, but the word hail, suggesting ice, is used as a translation for a Hebrew word, which means stones of bad. And it's a term that's more properly associated in biblical reference with meteorites. So the Midrashic sources say the stones which fell on Egypt were hot. And in Exodus it says specifically they fell mingled with fire. It doesn't say that in all translations, but in many that it does. And Ippua, our eyewitness, wrote that the trees are destroyed, no herbs, no fruits are found. Grain has perished on every side. That has perished which yesterday was seen. And in the Exodus it says, In all the land of Egypt the hail struck down everything in the fields, man and beast. It struck all the crops, it shattered every tree. That's hellish hail, right? Similar accounts come in the Buddhist texts. They say <laughs> when a world cycle is destroyed by wind, there arises a wind. And first it raises a fine dust, then a coarse dust, then a fine sand, then a coarse sand, then grit, then stones up to boulders as large as mighty trees. All the mansions on earth are destroyed when worlds clash with worlds. And that again is more or less a precise description of what we see when we read the Exodus. And again, the planetary agency is specifically identified in the text. Velikovsky suggests that the uh, tail of the comet was composed of carbon and hydrogen. That's why he predicted that carbo hydrocarbons would be found on Venus and he was correct. And he suggests that on entering the atmosphere, these hydrocarbons bond with any oxygen that's up there and they form a sticky liquid and basically burst into flames. The rest of the stuff that's coming in, lacking sufficient oxygen, becomes fluid in swift transition and falls to the earth simply as a sticky fluid. <coughs> and another common component of these ancient accounts from both hemispheres is a rain of fire. The Popol Vuh, which is another Mayan sacred text meaning the Book of Common Things, <laughs> Uh, a book of common things. People were drowned in a sticky substance raining from the sky, and then there was a great din of fire above their heads. The manuscript Quiche, another Mayan tome, says there descended from the sky a rain of bitumen and of a sticky substance. The earth was obscured and it rained day and night. And the Vogels, again from a completely different place, this time in Siberia, they say God sent a sea of fire upon the earth. The cause of the fire they call the fire water. And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such, that as, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And Ippowah said, the gates and walls and columns are consumed by fire. And the magician said, the Egyptians refused to let the Israelites go, and the Lord poured out a stream of hot naphtha over them. And even in the later books of the Bible, in the wisdom of Solomon, the population of Egypt was pursued with strange rains and hails and showers inexorable and utterly consumed with fire. For what was more marvellous of all, in water which quenches all things, the fire yet wrought more mightily. So we know it's petrol, don't we? And what, because when you pour water on it, it burns more mightily. The Egyptians had problems with some of their pyramids just bursting into flames. The uh, Israelis, the children of Israel, when they were wandering in the desert, do you remember it's gloomy all the time? 
but they come across these wildfires everywhere. They spring up amongst the rocks in the desert. They consume Aaron, Yahweh's first priest. He walks forward with some incense at some point, and poof, he's gone, smoking sandals time. So this wildfire, and really interestingly, is everywhere where these myths exist, everywhere where fire is said to have fallen from the sky in the form of a sticky liquid, there are now reserves of oil still. So Vanikovsky argues that at least some of the oil that's on Earth is star oil. I would say that many, much of it might be, and also say that the rest of it might not have formed over time, but as a result of the huge kind of shifts we see when this kind of thing starts happening. We're now getting really close to this planetary-sized body. It's almost as big as Earth. It's almost as big as Earth, and it's probably you know four or five diameters away. And so there's a disturbance in the rotation of the Earth as a result of this gravitational attraction. Maybe it's axial tilt changes. And there's terrific hurricanes sweeping the Earth because of this change in velocity, and, the, and also because of the sweeping gases, dust and cinders of the comet. Not to mention all the dust and stuff that's now being thrown out because of all the active volcanoes that have suddenly sprung up. And the rabbinical sources say that a strong wind endured for seven days. And on the fourth, fifth and sixth days, the darkness was so dense that the people of Egypt could not stir from their place. The darkness was of such a nature that it could not be dispelled by artificial means. The light of the fire was either distinguished, extinguished by the violence of the storm, or else it was made invisible and swallowed up in the density of the darkness. Nothing could be discerned. None was able to speak or hear. So the ninth plague, darkness. As Earth entered deeper into the tail and approached the body of the comet, Velikovsky proposes that the Egyptian darkness, if it was caused by a change of the axial tilt or of the Earth's actual stasis making the luminaries appear still, then it must have affected the whole globe with either a prolonged day or a prolonged night, which of course was the stories that I originally came across all those years ago. The tradition, and it is a tradition of many places to the north, south, west of Egypt, they all recall a cosmic event during which the sun did not shine for many days. And in the collective traditions of the New World, this is, this is so as well. It's related that in an event preceded by a cosmic collision of the stars, again that kind of planetary agency, the sun did not appear for five days. Even the epic of Gilgamesh, which comes out of Babylon, recounts that a dark cloud rose and rushed against the earth. Desolation, it says, stretched to heaven. All that was bright turned to darkness nor could brother distinguish his brother. Very like Ippel's words there. Six days, the hurricane, hurricane, deluge, and tempest continued sweeping the land, and all humanity back to its clay was returned. That's very similar, that's from Babylon, but it's really similar to, uh, to Mayan, Mayan stories. One of their world ages was finished by a hurricane. In fact, our word hurricane comes from their word, for spirit from the Mayan word, spirit of the hurricane. And another thing that happened at the end of one of the world ages in the Maya, though not that one, was that all of humanity was turned to clay, turned back to the mud from which it was made. So there are amazing echoes there from ancient Babylon to be found in some of the surviving Mayan texts, which they were nearly all burnt. They wrote loads of stuff on, on, bark, on bark and on deer skin, and we've got, I think, five, something like five partial uh, texts left, and that's all. Biblical tradition said that most of the Israelites survived untouched by the darkness, under cover of which escape from Egypt was made. I don't remember whether you all remember that. If I remember rightly as well, they all, uh, they all had a bit of the household silver away on the way out, which I think is a really amusing tale given the circumstances. But we're told that it was the darkness that enabled to get out of Egypt in the seventh day of this thing when it's really dark. Unfortunately, their very own rabbinical sources state that during the plague of darkness, the vast majority of Israelites perished as many as 49 out of 50, sources say. And in China, during the reign of Emperor Yahu, a great catastrophe brought a world age to a close, and for 10 days the sun did not set. The Emperor Yahu, very interesting name, like Yahweh. And again, he goes into the name, many names around the world that sound like Yahu or Yahweh. And what he's saying is that they, by now, with the earthquake and all the meteorites, there's a whole load of roaring in the sky, the earth's groaning and making a lot of noise. And he's thinking that not only the name Yahweh that was assumed by a lot of people came from these noises, but that maybe the Ten Commandments did as well, because he reckons that further on we had a similar encounter to this, which resulted in all the upset that's described when Moses brings the Ten Commandments down. And again, that story makes a lot of sense once you think of it in a planetary context instead of a, a God and the, 
uh, writing on the rock and all that. And like I say, Velikovsky's not sparing in his examples. And I was amazed. I was totally amazed by the sheer amount and spread of global myth on this. I was familiar with a lot of the Mayan stuff, a bit of the stuff from South America, but I was gobsmacked to find the Siberians and the Mongolians and the Australians and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Tibetans and the Buddhists and everybody, everybody's got this material. Even us in our Bible, hidden in plain sight, we just didn't know what it was. Brings us to the 10th plague of Egypt, the death of the firstborn. Velikovsky reckons this is a bit of an error, a mistake in translation because the word firstborn in the original language is apparently Bukor, I don't know how you say it, B-K-H-O-R. Velikovsky reckons that the word was actually B-C-H-O-R, which means death of the chosen, because what happens is a lot of people die in this part of the catastrophe. The earth, forced out of its regular motion, reacted to the close approach of the body of the comet and a major shock convulsed the lithosphere. And the area of the earthquake was the entire globe and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And yet the angel of the Lord passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt. When he smote, he delivered their houses. And now we know what the smiting is, don't we? There's a lot of smiting in the, great, in the Old Testament, and this is the smiting that's going on. The children of Israel were living as slaves, they were probably living in relatively insubstantial structures, certainly compared with the palaces and the temples, all of which we know the Egyptians were pretty good at, don't we? Very difficult to knock down an Egyptian temple, and in fact, some of the ones we've got must have withstood this, which I find interesting. The Israelis would have been living in much more, much less substantial stuff, so they had less chance of being killed when it fell. Again, same thing in Mexico, when, when the crap hit the fan over there, a lot of uh, younger people survive because it is, the, it is the way over there that when youngsters get married, they live in kind of grass huts at the foot of their in-laws' garden for a few years before they actually move into more heavy-duty uh, places. And this is where the action really starts. This is where they're really in trouble. The head of the celestial body approached very close, breaking through the darkness of the gaseous envelope. And according to the Midrashim, the, the last night in Egypt was as bright as the moon on the day of the summer solstice. It's been dark for many days now, and suddenly there's light. And they're very clear in these texts, it's not the sun they're seeing. Artapalus wrote that there was hail and earthquake by night, so that those who fled from the earthquake were killed by the hail, and those who sought shelter from the hail were destroyed by the earthquake. And at that time, all the houses fell in and most of the temples. And practically word for word, we read the same account from Mexico. Um, Tides are normally caused by the sun and especially the moon, something else that's going to be gone into in a bit more detail on Sunday afternoon. The proximity of the larger celestial body would have had great effect of raising walls of water miles high. And in the 18th century, a character called Lalande estimated that if a, a comet roughly the size of the Earth was to come within four diameters of the Earth, it would raise the water on the Earth 4,000 metres high. So the water, the seas would stand on end. The slowing down of stasis causes tidal recession to the poles anyway, and the presence of the celestial body would also draw water towards it. So all of these things would be exaggerated. The annual annals of the Emperor Yahoo say that in their vast extent, the waters overtopped the great heights, threatening the heavens with their floods. The Choctaw Indians of Oklahoma, the earth was plunged in darkness for a long time. Finally, a bright light appeared in the north, but it was mountain-high waves rapidly coming nearer. Peru, five days and nights of no sun, then the ocean left the shore and broke over the continent. Again, consistent tales from around the world. Two concurrent elements in these traditions. Complete darkness for several days, and when light broke, a mountain-high wave bringing destruction. As we've heard in Exodus, there were days of complete darkness, six or seven days of them, and the last of these days, it was reckoned, was at the Red Sea. As the world plunged out of darkness, the floor of the sea was revealed, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and left. And in the rabbinical literature, it says, the water was suspended as if it were glass, solid and massive. Great words. So there you have it. And then there was a spark. As Earth passed through the gas, dust and meteors of the comet's tail at the neck, close to the now candescent body of the comet, which we will hopefully hear about just before the end of the tale, why it's candescent. For a while the comet followed the orbit of the Earth and then retreated and then re-approached, shrouded in a column of gases, which looked like smoke by day and fire by night, 
which is exactly how Yahweh was described as leading the children of Israel through the desert, atop a column of fire by day, column of smoke by day, and fire by night. Each time he wants them to move, the column moved. This is another really important point. At the moment, what we've got is incessant and violent electrical discharges between the atmospheres of the comet and the Earth, and also between the tail itself, which has been divorced from the comet. It's made of a load of meteors and everything. They're all electrically charged, and so there's this, just this massive firework display, petroglyphs of which we're going to see in the second half of the talk when we look into the modern theory of the electric universe. But this is what, this is what Velikovsky was assuming 50 years ago, when loads of the stuff we talk about in the last 20 minutes he had no idea. Totally, you know, he's totally out there, really. Um, the discharges tore the column, i.e. the tail of the comet, to pieces, a process that was accompanied by a rain, another rain of meteorites on Earth. The globe of the comet lost a portion of its atmosphere and much of its electrical potential and withdrew again. And then six weeks on, the distance between the two decreased once again. There was a further wave of chaos across Earth, which is all covered in the book and in the Bible. There were further discharges and then they parted. The first story we saw of the sun standing still in the sky came from the book of Joshua. That happened 52 years after this. 52 years after this, the comet came back and there was, uh, there was more chaos and derision poured upon the face of the family earth. And for generations after that, not only the people of the Holy Lands through their jubilees every 52 years remembered this, but also the Aztecs, the people in Mexico, the people in Peru, they have new fire ceremonies. Every 52 years they put out all of their fires, they keep one fire burning somewhere in the centre of um, the uh, body politic. And once they see the stars are in the same place in the sky, then they'll relight all of their fires and everything will be cool for another 52 years. Once again, it's remembered around the bow. And the head of the comet did not crash into the earth. This is really important. There doesn't seem to be any physical impact in any of these tales. Instead, it exchanged a major electrical discharge. It's to do with the redistribution of electrical potential, not the redistribution of mass through actual collision. A tremendous spark would have sprung forth at the moment of the nearest approach of the comet, when the waters of the earth were heaped at their highest above the surface, and when it was as bright as the noonday sun on the solstice in Egypt, after those seven days of complete darkness when brother couldn't distinguish brother. Out of nowhere, let there be light. And the waters were released after the spark, followed, alas, by a rain of debris torn from the body and the tail of the comet. So another wave of hot rocks. And we know, don't we, it's funny, isn't it? We know that great discharges of interplanetary force are found in traditions and legends and myths from all over the world. All of us who had anything to do with myth know this. The Greeks used Icelandic Odin, Finnish Ukko, Perun from Russia, Woden from Germany, the master of the Persians, Marduk of the Babylonians, the earlier version of Marduk, his name we can't remember, from the Sumerians. And even Shiva of the Hindus, they're all described as the god who threw his thunderbolt at a world overwhelmed with water and fire. Every single story, clear as a bell. How come we missed it? I think it's brilliant. If more stuff like this comes up, we're really going to know what's going on within a year or so, and everything will have changed. Arguably, Velikovsky's biggest heresy is the suggestion that Venus, for it is she, arrived in historical times as a comet and became a planet. But that's what we hear in our myths. But even though Venus appears to have turned up from the head of Jupiter in the myths of the Greeks and the Romans and several others before them, and even though she appears to have turned up as a new planet, there was a name for Venus, even as far back as Suma. They called her Inanna. She was known in Babylon. She was known as Ishtar in Babylon. So her name... The goddess existed, it appears, before the planet arrived. But like I say, I don't feel particularly precious about whether it was Venus or not. It's quite clear from the stories, just the ones that I've covered, let alone the immense, immense range of stuff that Velikovsky covers, that something happened. And we might as well call it Venus. Venus is from the Latin Vene, which means come, recently come, the most recently come planet, as I was talking to um, Santos about the other day. And Velikovsky quotes loads of anomalous astronomical record, records from Egypt, from Babylon, from the Vedas. But they are inscribed on the walls. And all the moderns go is, oh, they obviously weren't paying attention. You know, you've got all these brilliant star maps that they could go, oh, this is all completely accurate. The stuff that doesn't fit their theory, they just go, oh, well, they weren't looking. And we know how carefully these people were looking at the stars. We know how carefully they wrote their narratives. We've heard some of them. 
But like I say, for our purposes, it's just important because we don't know that any of this stuff's happened. All I'm after doing is establishing that it has and that it's established in written history and it's established in the written history that gets read out of the church pulpit. Well, actually, this stuff doesn't get read out of the church pulpit. They don't like to concentrate on you too much, do they? During the Exodus, night was turned to day, sun and moon appeared to stand still in the sky. The earth was swept by hurricanes, meteorites, cinders, ash, and a rain of flammable liquid. And here's a thing. When we heard about the flammable liquid, we were talking about hydrocarbons. They were in the tail of the comet that came into the earth. Maybe there's star oil on the earth. But it wasn't only hydrocarbons. It was carbohydrates, because they're the same thing. And it turns out that the milk and honey of the Exodus was real too that in the early morning, this stuff kind of uh, condensed somehow in the desert, and the children of Israel could live off it. So out of all of this mayhem, arose a food that kept people going for the time when they were wandering the deserts. And that too was global. In Mexico, we hear that the rivers turned to milk and smelt of honey. And it's this, these are carbohydrates also coming from the tail of the comet. So these guys were eating the tail of the comet. How far out is that? So, I mean, in a way, that looked weird when you read it in the Bible, but it's even weirder when you find that's what's happening. But it does mean that the actual cause of the catastrophe, as we feel is often energetically the case, also supplied the means of surviving it. For those that did survive, of course, not everybody did by any means. These events and the earthquake that accompanied them were experienced across the globe. And old mountains crumbled, new ones rose, the seas boiled, and earth and sky became clamorous with noise. The erratic course of the comet caused consternation every 52 years from generations thereafter. Periodic encounters between Mars, Earth and Venus after 700 BC, so this is another 50, no, 750 years on. And then Venus started on its erratic orbit to interrupt Mars. And then we started seeing interactions between Venus, Earth and Mars. And these are all reported in the prophets of Isaiah and in Homer's Iliad and they're in written history as well, because it's only 750 BC. Once you know to look for it, when you go back and look at these old books, books that you might have read 20 or 30 years ago, they will be completely different for you, because I've been rifling through my bookshelves since this. Things like the Popal Vu and the Bible. It's wild, it's really wild. It's a real opening up of the neural pathways to new possibilities. Velikovsky demonstrates that these latter encounters between Venus and Mars resulted in similar but much smaller scale and much more localised, though still global, um, encounters, shall we say. When his book was published, all other scientists refused to allow their text to be considered by Velikovsky's pub publisher, and the boycott led perforce to a new publishing deal. And I'm sure the new publishers were well chuffed at 16 impressions in 23 years. Uh, the scientific press didn't just criticise him. According to one commentator, they carved violently on this subject. Now, I think that's a great sign for Velikovsky. They'll just bloody ignore you if you don't matter. If you're saying something important, they will be having a go. And they really had a go at Velikovsky, and they had a go at him for decades, and he stuck to his guns. And they weren't suggesting that his material needed review in this nice kind of um, peerish sort of uh, compadre language that they used. They were saying that the material was insane. They were saying that Velikovsky was a kook. No wonder they couldn't validate all that stuff he predicted that their probes later showed to be true. And once again, that's your peer review. There it is. Um, Velikovsky saw information from all cultures across history, their myths, their writings, their iconography. And he concluded, and he isn't the only one to conclude this, that common expression across time and space most likely arises from common experience. And common experience can only occur when there's actual global events taking place. The stories are all told differently in each context, suggesting that they were not copied. They're specific to the cultures in which they're found. But apart from that, they clearly describe identical events in clear and basic terms. And yet every critic of the Bible has said that they're talking in poetic language. They're talking about the fall of their kingdom, not their earth. They're not realising that when they say fire and brimstone, they mean fire and brimstone. When they say all the kingdoms tottered, they're mean all the kingdoms totter. When they say that the mountains fell and new mountains were created, that is what they mean. It might be slightly fiery language, but they are describing absolutely what they happened to them, and as soon as you recognise it, it just goes ping, it's like the shutters kind of rising in your mind. The similarity of these narrative memories, often modified actually slightly by a position on the, on the physical earth, 
show that these events happened in historical time, i.e. after some method had been developed of recording them, or in a narrative first hand and then to a script, spoken narrative, rock art, pictographs, it's in many different forms. But despite being described by so many varied sources in the orthodox scientific world, it is as if none of this information exists. This is the, uh, we've come to just, um, just about on the first hour. I this is the last slide of the, of the hour. I reckon the second half of the talk is about 20 minutes or half an hour long. We need to get it finished by whatever time it says on the programme. I don't have one here. So it's, uh, I'll just go through this last slide on the first half whilst you decide whether you want to have a bit of a break and come back or whether we should uh, press on and have a quick look at the, what, the elect modern, what modern science is making of this stuff in the laboratory. In 1972 there was a documentary made called Velikovsky, The Bonds of the Past and in it a head of a community college says if I had my way every young student in my college would be required to study this case. Not only because Velikovsky is very interesting but because he is truly interdisciplinary, another crime in modern science is to know more than your own field. He is the human expression of ideas symbolic of the problem the young think they are facing, and which, in my opinion, they are now facing. The attitudes expressed by the mainstream represent the extreme rigidification of institutions through which thought is supposed to occur, extreme to the point where it begins to contaminate the fluidity and looseness, the freedom to think. And are we not seeing that everywhere? This is that story writ large. We're seeing it again and again, but this is a particularly impressive example of it. But fortunately, for our purposes, not all science is orthodox. And unorthodox scientists are making great use of modern electrical theory, of telescopes, of laboratories, and of the internet. And we can find out a little bit of what it looked like to fly through the tail of a comet. And we can find out just what it is that NASA makes of its own information in the idea of an electric universe. So would you like to press on? Or would you like to have a bit of a break? Mm -hmm. no, I reckon I'd like a bit of a break. Yeah. A bit of a break? Yeah. Shall we have a... Um, yeah. It's now nearly six o'clock. What time are you to finish? Uh, yeah. Quarter to seven. No, around 18.45. Yeah, quarter to seven. So if we could make it a sort of, um, I've got five to you, but it's nearly six o'clock in there. If we can go for 10 or 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and I'll really wrap it through tea, the second half. Tea, coffee, and all that it's bar open yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right on. Let's give you a good round of applause. Give you a shout. Is it all right? Is it, it worth it? Yeah. Worth it. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm going to kick off again at quarter past because okay. I reckon I can uh, I reckon I can do this in half an hour. Okay. Hey. <laughs> I love this talk because the other thing is that there's stuff, real time stuff coming into me about the state of the solar system. Just as I've been warming up for this, and yeah. you constantly have to knock bits out and put bits in. Yeah. First time I did it at the Green Gathering, it's like um, there's there's one of me talking and the other one's monitoring what's going on, and you can feel it going off and back on. And this is the first version of it that I think is really flying like the arrow I want it to be. Because, I mean, we didn't know... Credit, Velocity. See, a lot of people who do talks obviously get their, a lot of work from him, but don't give him a mention. Yeah. Because they don't want to give him a mention. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah. They pass it on if it's there, so it's good I, that you actually... I really want... I mean, the thing is, I can only I can only skip off the top of the material there. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, they, there's enough material left lying around to do another do talk. on the edges in chaos as well. I right? think I probably will. That, yeah, I, yeah. I've already got half of one of those done. And I've got two critical texts still to read, so... I did, in fact, try to get Velikovsky's Ages in Chaos, but much to my horror, is currently available as three volumes of 17 quid each, right, yeah. or one volume of 35 quid, which is out of print. There's, a, there's but, another one, but not, uh, I don't know the author is, it's um, revisiting the last uh, manual. But... Well, that'd be well worth doing because these, yeah. these Pioneer and Voyager probes, uh, that, that again, you see, that was NASA. They, they had a bloke on holiday or an intern or something hanging around with them. And he was looking at the planets and he was going, do you know what, in a couple of years' time we could use the lineup of the planets and the moons to lob a couple of probes out to the very edge of the heliosphere and to look at all the moons and planets on the way out, not once, but several times. And NASA went, oh yeah, you're right, we'll do it then. 
So they got this, got this intern to kind of work it all out, and then they sent out two Voyager probes, and the other two, whose name, Pioneer, two Pioneer, two Voyager, and other probes as well, but those were the main ones. And they're still going, they're still working, they're really almost on the edge of interstellar space now, and they're still, they're still registering activity from the sun. They're still feeling these charges in the ionosphere. Amazing. Still working. Excellent. If only they'd start building things that lasted that long and selling them to us, eh? Well, I think you're wrong. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm totally wrong. I'm not trying to claim that I'm right. I'm just saying it's, I'm just saying it's interesting, isn't it? Oh, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't really mean it. No, no, it's all just a joke. I'm just having you on. It's a waste of your time. <laughs> so, I'm going to kick off because I want to make sure we get through all of this and give the, uh, the next. Oh, it's supper, isn't it? Supper time. All oh, right, yeah. Okay. I don't want to compete with supper. <laughs> so, we had to really slip over the bit about Venus and Mars because, I mean, I'd, I'd really love to tell you about a 7th century. Uh, tablet from Ashurbanipal's library at Minima that shows that the heliacal rising of Venus varied in those days between one and five months. The moderns know it's 72 days. I mean, I'd love to tell you about the Syrian king called Sennacherib, who was the son of Sargon, and probably many of us heard of both of those, who was besieging Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of Hezekiah, as it happens, and of Isaiah predicting a 10 degree reversal of the sun and that the army would be destroyed by a blast from heaven. And that, that very night it came to pass that the angel of the Lord smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand, and behold, they were all dead corpses. The classical writers say that their souls had gone, but their clothes were still there. <laughs> so, I'd love to tell you about a bolt from Mars that fell on Volsinium, one of the chief cities of the Etruscans, the civilization that preceded Rome. And that in the time of Romulus, who was a contemporary of Hezekiah, and he was the founder of Rome, and that in his time, a plague fell upon the land, bringing sudden death with no sickness and a rain of blood. And that the death of Romulus himself was accompanied by strange and unaccountable disorders that changes filled the air, and night came with awful peals of thunder and furious blasts. And that during this time, both the poles shook, the sun vanished, and the sky was riven with shooting flames. I'd love to tell how the poles were uprooted, the seasons confounded, the lengths of the months and years became inconstant, that the earth rolled over, that the sun rose in the west, and that Babylon moved two and a half degrees south. But there isn't time. <laughs> <laughs> so if his first heresy was Venus as a comet, and I think as a result of that, loads of people who need to read this book don't, they just hear that and that's it, they're gone. His second heresy was this idea that the universe was electric. The Thunderbolts project, thunderbolts.info, one of my favourite projects on the internet. Absolutely brilliant, everything they've put on there. Thank you, Noel. If it's all right with Noel, it's all right by me. <laughs> <laughs> and the work of the Thunderbolts project begins in um, a movie called Symbols of an Alien Sky. We're missing it off the edge of the video there. That's Symbols of an Alien Sky. See it. Uh, they go back to um, looking 13,000 years beyond the events of the Exodus into the past to the most ancient art yet found in terrestrial caves. I can now correct that statement, but I'm not going to do it right now. The paintings at Lascaux are currently believed to be 17,000 years old. They were executed by what today we would call realists. The pictures of animals, landscapes and clouds show knowledge of movement, form and colour. They are both unique and they are completely sudden in their arising. There are no sketches that come before these, there's just these. Why the people who painted these murals disappeared remains a mystery, as it must be said does where they came from in the first place. They're completely mysterious, but look at all of that in there. What a bunch of feeling there is in that picture. You can much more easily tell what sort of meat you're looking at there than in your modern lasagna. Horse meat. Horse meat. What came after such realistic paintings was until very recently a complete mystery. Our ancestors appeared completely to abandon their drive to produce naturalistic scenes and instead they represent what symbols of an alien sky calls absurd creatures and ghostly figures which have never been before been seen in our world. This particular example comes from the American Southwest. The video shows lots of examples. Here's one that's Australian. Um, and sometimes these things appear in quantity as well. I can't quite remember where this one came from, 
Uh, might have been the Persian Gulf, might have been North America. I'll have to have another look and check it out. To be uh, advised, as it were. Um, Isn't that Northern Territories Australia? Well, there you go, it might be Australia. Australia, North America, or the Gulf, I think uh, I will check it out. But actually, there's similar things everywhere. The point is that these stick creatures are everywhere. You see, you notice the various stick men in there. Um, even the image apparently showing a man with a duck on his head is really surprisingly common. So now at last I know where Terry Pratchett got his man with the duck on the head from. Um, now, as it happens, the collation of thousands of rock art images have enabled a character called Anthony Peratt of Los Alamos Labs to set up a supercomputer which identifies formations as seen from different positions on Earth. And the quote from the Visions of an Alien Sky says, the fit that he has documented cannot be accidental. Investigations by the Thunderbolts project, which preceded Peratt's work by three decades, converge with his later work in extraordinary ways. Now imagine what that must feel like for the Thunderbolts people. They've been hacking away at the coalface for 30 years. Bloke comes along, takes loads of photographs, puts it all on the computer and goes, you're completely right. <laughs> that must have been amazing. Hopefully there's going to be more of that going on as well. And your basic stick man occurs in quantity all over the world and it shows really only slight variations on a recognisable form. It is an apparently human figure with arms, legs, body and significantly a pair of dots, one under each arm. I've chosen representative examples from Spain, Armenia, the United Arab Emirates and Arizona. There are many, many more shown in the video. See the video. Each is a variant on the basic form, but includes the main elements that we summarised just then. Peratt shows that these forms recorded electrical events in the sky. He matches each of the rock art forms precisely to configurations taken by high energy electric discharge in the laboratory. Variations in representations of the stick and dots are matched throughout by variations in the form taken by electrical discharge in a plasma. Basic elements of the plasma discharge can be seen here. An axis along which the discharge occurs, in this case vertical, but it can be tilted, it can be horizontal. Mm -hmm. There's a champagne glass formed by two upward pointing limbs at the top and a central bulge always upwards in the body corresponding to the stick man's head. There's a flattened bell formed by two downward pointing limbs splayed out slightly in the bottom, quite often but not always. And again, a central feature which is smaller bulge often represented as the stick man's genitalia. A torus surrounding the centre of the discharge axis, which represented in 2D, the torus becomes two dots shown on either side of what would be the chest or the thorax of the stick. So what we're seeing in these petroglyphs is undoubtedly, and without any argument at all, pictures of electrical discharges in the sky, such as those described by Velikovsky when the comet's tail was torn from its body. Now isn't that strange? And these images occur similarly in groups all over the world. They're not only widespread, but where they do occur, there are often many of them. Just like I imagine that crackling sky, you know. And until the laboratory work was undertaken and the similarities identified, these figures were a complete mystery to both archaeology and history. But the recent work moves the images as carved from mystery to history. <laughs> and hopefully, we're going to see a lot more of that as well. We have a very limp we have a very limited written history, but it goes all the way back to that first sun, Saturn. Another tale entirely, but one way or the other, the information has made it all the way through to now. And by gaining an understanding of these rock art images, and other images such as these, we're extending the comprehensible part of the story that has been recorded beyond writing. We're looking further back in our own time, no telescope needed. And now there's a well-established new approach to our history, and that of the solar system, and it's one that considers high energy electrical events in the ancient skies. And these, electric, these ideas of an electrified cosmic environment, science knew nothing of only a few decades ago. And take it from me, if you look at science now, it might just as well know nothing about it now either. It continues. Redistribution of charge between heavenly bodies such as Earth and Velikovsky's comet is a phenomenon identified by the team of the Thunderbolts project as hemispheric discharge. As we see here, it's reproducible in the laboratory, unlike a lot of the science that comes from orthodoxy. We can see two spheres. The upper is negatively charged, the lower is positive, and there is a considerable potential energetic interaction between the two. Remember that spark that preceded the onrush of water in the Exodus? 
shining through the pervasive gloom in Egypt, as bright as the noonday sun at the solstice. Just like that. Visions of an alien sky looks at Mars as a giant laboratory on which the effects of electric discharge can be identified. So here we go. The movement of charge through a medium is characterised by dendritic branching or bifurcation. They're known as Lichtenberg figures, but we've all seen them in lightning. We see them in the branches of trees, we see them in the roots of trees, we see them in the physical structure of our own brains, and we also see them in the synaptic firing of our brains, so in the energetic structure. These dendritic branchings or bifurcations are one of the basic, basic methods by which nature does things. The flow of water, as in this picture, exhibits, exhibits similar though not identical properties. It tends to flow. You don't get sudden things coming off to the side and backwards, and you don't get sudden spots either side of the channels with water. With electricity, you always do. The top picture here is laboratory discharge into wet wood. It's described by the Thunderbolts dot info team as rotating cylindrical arcs, sputtering along a path of primary discharge, just like we saw in the uh, stick figures. But on the earth, on a solid surface, it produces scalloping of the channel walls, which is a turning in, they make them, make them look like scallops, basically. Yeah, that's an easy way of saying it. Scalloping of the channel walls, sharp angular projections coming at unlikely angles, and they are inconsistent, inconsistent with fluid flow. The lower picture is a surface affected by a high voltage current exhibiting a complex of gouges and craters along the discharge channel or close by. You see a series of little black dots as the discharge crater. There aren't many places around this way, but those are all little individual arcs with these scallops, scallop sides and sharp edges at the top. The steady evolution that's been imagined for Earth has been similarly envisaged for Mars, and orthodoxy imagines a landscape shaped by erosion of wind and water on a geological time scale. As we heard about the Earth, on the left here we see the Nurga Vallis on the surface of Mars. We can see that it is a scalp channel made up of a series of circular crater-like forms and sharp angular projections, as previously described. This is inconsistent with the favoured theory of erosion by water and wind, say the Thunderbolts team, but entirely consistent with electrical discharge machining, but on a planetary scale. For comparison, the picture on the right is a fine example of the dendritic branching of laboratory charge into the wet wood, and hopefully nobody here is having any difficulty seeing the similarity between those two things. Um, there's one that's even a little bit better, I think. You can really see the scalloped edge of that. This is called the Avernus Collis on Mars. You can see these little discharge craters where the little rotating sputtering arcs are digging out just more kind of craters. Um, and that's, uh, that's, I think it's a lot easier to see than the first one. Another problem... Like there's cup marks. Yep, yeah, they are like cup marks. I mean, they're it's so not. big, there's no way that water would have made those No, plans. no, and anyway, it would have to have been completely divorced from the, yeah. the, pad, the, the channels that it's supposed to be running in. This is another major problem for the standard... Um, I wonder if we can... Oh, it doesn't make any difference to you, never mind. Um, another thing that standard planetary theory also has some difficulty accounting for are craters such as these. At present, craters are assumed to have been caused by impact from other cosmic bodies, but the top picture has a crater with a mound in its centre, and the lower picture looks like it once had a mound in the centre, it then, then got hit by another impact of some sort. Uh, the more percipient amongst you will know that there are craters like this on the Moon as well. If you look at the Voyager and Pioneers, they're everywhere. There's craters like this everywhere. Um, these are assumed to be rare and ancient remnants of impacts into a relatively fluid medium. So the idea is that before everything cooled down, they got hit by a few things and these resulted. But they would have had to come from Earth to make the impact yeah. on the side we're looking at. But also, yeah, but it's also true to say that even though these are deemed to be rare, they're really difficult to account when you get two or more of them appearing in close proximity. And if you look at the bottom one, there's actually, you can't see it quite on this, but you can on here is there's a pair of nipples in the middle of those two craters up about one o'clock outside the main crater. So you get to see several of them. If you go looking at pictures on Mars, there's quite a few of them. Um, the Thunderbolts project say, what do you reckon to this then, Noel? They say that ionised discharge allows for subsequent discharge along the same path. Yeah, well, yeah. once you establish the route. There you go. Yeah. Lightning can strike twice. Yeah. That's what's going on. Don't forget. NASA are still saying this is an electrically neutral universe. They really do deny that this is happening. 
Features such as those seen so far are restricted to the southern hemisphere of Mars, which is a deeply featured and ingrained surface. The northern hemisphere of Mars appears to have been stripped of all such detail. It all appears to have been ripped away. It seems to be entirely smooth in most of the images you'll see. But at high resolution, it can be seen to bear an uncanny resemblance to surfaces that have been machined in a laboratory by means of electrical discharge. So on the left we see a region of the northern hemisphere of Mars at high resolution. On the right we see um, an electron microscope view of electron discharge machining in the laboratory. Hopefully again we can all see the similarities there. The scale of the valleys and corries in previous slides is indiscernible, but Mars is home to the second biggest rift valley in the solar system, Valles Marinaris. Perhaps we should be marginally disturbed to hear that the biggest rift valley in the solar system exists on Earth. Yeah. This one's 2,700 kilometres long, 200 kilometres wide, and 7,000 <coughs> metres deep. It exhibits all of the characteristics of electrical discharge examined so far, but on a truly massive scale. And the Mars rovers, remember, have dispatched pictures showing that the land around this feature, you can't see it from this distance, but it's scattered liberally and profusely by rocks. And these rocks are all below a given size. And the team at the Thunderbolts Info say that this huge chasm was machined in mere microseconds of geological time on a planetary scale and that the larger rocks were hurled into space to become comets or meteors. And as it happens in 2005, NASA, my favourite organisation, launched an 800 pound copper probe at Comet Temple 1 to find out whether comets really are icy slushy dirt balls or not. 800 pound copper probe straight out of the 800 quid or 800 million? Uh, what? 800 or 800 million? 800, 800 pounds of copper oh, probe. Oh, 800 lump weight. Yeah, oh, right. and this enabled the electric, the electric universe people knew this was going to happen, so they were able to make a load of predictions. NASA knew it was going to happen because they were doing it, and they were able to make a load of predictions as well. Can you guess who's going to tell us the more accurate prediction? Here we go. I found it personally very hard to believe, given all that I've read, and all that I've said to you, and a ton of other stuff that I know that I haven't been able to talk about, I find it impossible to believe that NASA could still support a model of the solar system that's electrically neutral. As we remember, it was a major heresy of Velikovsky to suggest such a thing. We know that the moons of Jupiter act electrically upon their giant neighbour constantly. We know that the Earth is constantly discharging itself in the form of lightning somewhere on the face of the planet. We know that the solar wind is a child of plasma. We know that the universe entire is envis envisaged by many as a vast charged web of electrical potential. How could we possibly be talking about an electrically neutral universe? It's, it just it does my head in. It does. And yet, how could NASA have missed all this? And yet, their deep impact program with their 800 pound copper probe really puts paid to any doubt as to what exactly they're thinking. Here we go. The mission launched a satellite to encounter the oncoming ten Comet Temple 1. 25,000 miles an hour, this thing was flying towards the pole. Uh, 800 pound copper probe laden with sensitive electronics. The information from the probe was, or impact uh, was relayed back to the satellite and then relayed back to Earth. NASA. We're expecting to encounter a ball of icy slush or solid ice with no electrical component. But as the header of this slide shows, which you can't read uh, as far as I can, it says first there was a small flash, then a delay, then there's a big flash, and then the whole thing breaks loose. Very surprising. That's Peter Schultz from NASA. Um, the header shows they were surprised. The Electric Universe people predicted, firstly, that electrical stress may short out the impact of electronics before impact. Tick, bang on guys. Secondly, that the signal would be disrupted in the final few seconds and that there would be an advanced flash or lightning-like discharge shortly before impact. All correct. Total saturation of NASA's instrumentation, because this isn't what they were looking for, and a massive flash, a little flash followed by a big flash, which meant that at that point in the progress, you couldn't see anything. Three, ten out of ten for that time. Um, luckily for them, it was predicted that the impact and or electrical discharge and both atoms would be into rock rather than loosely consolidated ice and dust. And indeed on impact there was an eruption of silica dust that was so thick and the explosion was so sustained that the local terrain was entirely obscured from the NASA instruments. Yay! This is what we pay them for. <laughs> Luckily, a second satellite known as SWIFT was monitoring the event with UV sensors. Moments after impact, they say, there was a quick and dramatic rise in UV light, evidence that deep impact probe struck a hard surface. NASA instruments were saturated at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 
this one was made, able to show that the actual initial temperatures of the impact were greater than or equal to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So they concluded it is not an icy ball of stuff. Oh, right. <laughs> NASA theorized that pressurized gases beneath the comet's surface explain the impressive velocities of cometary jets. And they hope to identify the vents for these jets. So they're saying there's a chemical process, NASA, are going on inside the comet, which is generating energy, which is coming out as jets. And that somehow that's sustaining itself as they kind of fly around. The electric universe predicted that discharge and or impact may initiate a new jet on the nucleus and could abruptly change the positions and intensities of other jets due to sudden change in charge distribution on the comet's nucleus. What do you think, Noel? I think they were right. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> the Nordic Optical Telescope identified that new jets yeah. appeared from the location of the impact itself. NASA's vents, it is perhaps surprising to say, were never found. The electric model predicts a sculpted surface, sharply defined craters, mesas, valleys, scalloping and ridges. The opposite of the softened relief, softened relief of a sublimating dirty snowman. <coughs> Familiar stuff by now, we saw it in the discharge. The size of the explosion and eruption of material would have prevented sight of what were anticipated by NASA to be the best images ever of a comet nucleus. That's what they were looking for. That was the main point of the mission, was to get the best ever they could of a cometary nucleus. Fortunately, the satellite Stardust Next was passing. It had done one comet and they sent it along, which is why they called it Next. It was passing some time after all this activity and so it was able to absorb, observe and record what it found. As predicted by NASA, craters, valleys, mesas, ridges were the order of the day. See those little areas of light out? Nothing has so far contradicted the electric model. What they were going to ask next was, is there any arcing on the surface of the meteor, on the surface of the comet? And that is what that is. That white out is electrical arcing that's occurring on the comet because it's catching bits of solar wind, which are positive, and it's got a negatively charged nucleus. Okay, so they could see it. NASA, NASA obviously weren't looking for that. Um, I think the SWIFT satellite might have been looking a bit more closely. Um, and they found that the most prominent MESA walls, so those scalloped walls and depressions, the craters, were being expanded by this arcing. So what they found was that here you can see, that you can't actually see it too well, yeah, it's a bit bright, but in fact this entire MESA wall here is shown to have been pushed out in the two or three weeks it took between the original probe going by and Swift Next Extra, the next thing, Swift Next Extra thing. You can't remember that one. They also showed that three craters had become one trench in these few short days. When Deep Impact, the 800 pound copper probe, was, uh, was hit this Temple One, it, the comet was at its closest to the sun, which means it was maximally candescent because it was taking a maximum amount of charge. Fortunately, it had also just received a wave of um, solar input from a solar flare that had left two and a half days before. And when you can, that's why it's so much brighter on here than it is on there, because the comet's making its way away from the positive source of electrical charge and because there's no solar flare. The Swift next flyby, like I say, occurred a little bit later on. Here we go, we're nearly there. NASA were expecting a deep impact probe to penetrate deep below the assumed icy surface exposing the primordial stuff of comet creation. Instead, they said, uh, here it is, you can see, you can't see it too well, there's no trace of that. That's what Swift next saw. They didn't even make a dent, guys. And what they're saying is that the crater amazingly refilled itself. <laughs> they're saying that a lot of stuff went up and came straight down again. And the, the comet people, they've got him saying that. <laughs> they've actually got him saying it on film. Uh, gravity, yeah, with, yeah. with a gravity of a billionth of that on yeah. Earth and exploding <laughs> material moving at thousands of miles an hour. Yeah, yeah right. So the Thunderbolts team figured that if it struck rock or discharged above the commentary surface due to an electrical event, it might look a lot different. Silica dust and little penetration. And they're exactly right, we see that. And yet, yeah, even now, this is 2005, okay? 2005, if one goes looking at NASA, the European Space Agency, space.com, spaceabout.com, I could list 18 websites where they will tell you that comets are dirty snowballs. Still. So whatever the lies are that we're being told that Kat Velikovsky concealed from us, whatever it is that hid the fact that the plagues of Egypt were a global event, not just the plagues of Egypt, it's happening still. And we can see it. NASA are paying for it. They're sending the stuff up. And then this is what we get. So I'm suggesting a new motto for NASA, which you can't actually see on that. It says, um, feck me, we weren't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> I really think they should all wear that on their suits. In closing, here's a thing. 
The shamanic peoples of Earth seem to have an uncanny grasp of these cycles of space and time. Could this be why we've been so busy burning their books? Many have prophesied the return of a golden age. And perhaps the best known of those cycles is the Kali Yuga, which tells of long cycles of forgetfulness and awakening. Our own astrological system foretells that the age of Aquarius will be an age of awakening. We've heard much tonight of chaos and mayhem amongst the celestial orbs, and that Venus has been central to all of this. We've seen the planets barreling through space. Seen the planets barreling through space, yet here is Venus seen from Earth amidst all this motion. Ev, this, these little kisses she makes to us every time she comes close to the Earth. She makes five of those in eight years, and because of her extremely slow rate of um, clockwise rotation, when she does kiss the Earth in her nearest point, the same face is pointing to Earth every time. Real beautiful synchrony, and that's, to with, that's accurate to within one part in a thousand, I think. It's very accurate. And here we see two pentagrams. The little pentagram are, 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 inf are inferior, superior conjunction, whatever, the conjunction that's when the planet's between us and the sun. The big one is the conjunction when the planet's on the other side of the sun from us. And he, she, she does both of those things in eight years. And that's what she looks like from Earth at the moment after all of this chaos with the planets doing the screwing through the, through the uh, cosmos thing. That's what she's doing. So out of all of this chaos, we've got order. And my argument would be that this is why we're being encouraged to think of steady geological de development, steady development of the cosmos, steady um, evolutionary development, steady development of your career, steady decline in your mortgage, steady growth of your pensions. <laughs> it's because they don't want us to know that sudden change can result in this sort of order. And also, if you knew that this sort of stuff was going down, would you really be paying insurance? Would you really be paying so much as a pension advisor? Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, that's what I think is going on. Um, so we're getting perfection from within the chaos. And that's what we see again and again in the world around us. And that's what we're seeing in this amazing cosmic story that we've witnessed tonight. So we began with a comet, the existence of which has somehow eluded us, like so many other things. But tales of it are hidden in plain sight in texts and narratives from around the world, and even throughout the books that form the basis of Christianity, Judaism and Islam. We've been led to believe that catastrophes resulting from the actions of planetary bodies actually arose from the will and agency of a deity. Or deity. We have been told, despite manifest evidence to the contrary, that our evolution, the evolution of geology, the evolution of the planet and the solar system, have been steady, peaceful and gradual. Even in our modern age, the investigations of NASA into the nature of comets in the cosmos clearly demonstrates a continued mixture of blindness, denial and mendacity. So in closing, we'll go to Stan Hall, with whom we started. He wrote a really excellent book called um, Savage Genesis, The Missing Page. He was also responsible for the artwork which showed the other planetary model that we have of everything springing from everything else. And here's the main point. Stan says, War mania and dogma will dominate the human spirit as long as that spirit remains imprisoned by false history and false beliefs. And the survival of civilization will depend on whether humanity chooses to confront its traumatic legacy with knowledge and common sense or perish with its dreams. Despite the aberrations of the past, human destiny will be revealed through beauty, wisdom and love and altruism, the highest of all religions, whether in the stilled hearts of those who have fallen and are falling on history's soon forgotten battlefields, or in the accusing eyes of a newborn child, this hope remains the enduring ideal, the truest and strongest purpose. On this piece of cosmic dust, mankind can yet summon the knowledge and the courage to root out the distortions of the past, realign human purpose, and nourish the inner vision that sees beyond this earth and beyond this time. Welcome to Truth Juice. Thank you very much, folks. Um, that, that should say Healing History, or I should say Worlds in Collision, and the Electric Universe, a Healing History Talk, presented by Ben Iyer, the artist previously known as Nick Marchmont. Because the encounter with Truth Juice has made me realise that I don't necessarily know who Nick Marchmont is, but I do know who Ben Iyer is. Based on the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky and the Thunderbolts project. Look them up. Lots of Velikovsky on the net. All the Thunderbolts project stuff is outrageous. 
just brilliant, there's loads of it. And also I host a radio show 9pm till midnight every Thursday on media streaming international radio. Dot com. Uh, you can catch us on www.msiradio.com and podcasts of my previous shows which do everything from badger calls through illegal mortgages to the nature of consciousness can be found at TNS, TNS radio dot doctor hyphen rock dot biz for historical reasons. I thank you very much for your attention. Now it's time to stop. No worries. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'm just about in time. Yeah, just well, yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Lunch is at seven, so... Sorry, stick that on in case anybody wants to see it again. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. I think the um, Venus thing's amazing. You know, it's like, you know, it just goes to show, doesn't it, with the... Um, with the apple, when you cut the that's apple, it. That's that just... is just telling you that yeah. you're all mate, that's what's keeping yeah. matter. Danny Costum yeah. says what that's what the apple is in Adam and Eve's yeah. story. He says it's Venus. When you look at that picture, it is. It yeah, because when you cut it in half, the apples make up the the seeds make a pentagon. That just goes yeah. to show you, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely amazing. It's far out, guys. Mm. It really is. We are living at the most amazing time in the I mean, most amazing solar system. If Venus, if Venus is doing that, what are all the other planets well, doing? Like, I mean, Saturn. Saturn it's got like an amazing yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, Saturn, Saturn's rings are only 10 metres thick, but we can see them from Earth. I know, but apparently, like, Saturn's got, uh, it connect, some people are saying that it's connected to the moon and things like that. Mm. Yeah. It all gets a bit freaky, yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And, and that's... Is it the only one that rotates the wrong way? Yeah. Venus is the only one that rotates the wrong no, way. That's and that's showing it on there. I know, it, it spins the wrong way on its axis, it orbits the same way as everything else. Oh, alright. Oh, right. Sorry, so that, yeah. I'll tell you one thing I've found out about Saturn, and that's to do with the fruit trees. Yeah. Yeah. But apparently, spruce, um, I know that Saturn goes round the Earth every 30 years, yeah. and apparently, the first time the spruce is fertile, is every uh, when it has its first seedlings is every 30 years that's wicked isn't that amazing which mm. is the christmas tree yeah mm. and saturnalia and saturnalia mm. yeah. isn't that and originally apparently, think all these things are all scientific and they're yeah. all hidden but they're there yeah. and that and that pattern yeah. that it makes does saturn make that pattern yeah and like the thing Venus is here's the moon. earlier story is that at one stage earth was a moon of saturn and Saturn stood in the night sky. The Egyptians had a, had a, a stella yeah. pointing to it. And Earth went round it. It stayed there at the top of this stella. It was visible night and day. It was as big as the Ooh. sun in the sky. Yeah, and all the other stars went round it. Like that. Ooh, yeah, and, and, and that was... Yeah. That was yeah. Oh, damn, that would have been brilliant. I know, I know. I'm working know. on it, though. Because it, that, it was the end living, of that. He's living near us, yeah. so we might, we might be able to... Great, because it was the end of that era. It was the end of the golden age of Saturn, yeah. and a va and an electrical discharge and a vast rain of what Velikovsky reckons was salty water. Yeah. It was the deluge that saw to Noah, yeah. or to the Pishtim, or whoever it is we want to allocate that story to. Oh, so that's another whole story, and which we're already. <laughs> and if anybody's ever seen that video on YouTube, it's well worth watching. Where. You've got the hexagon that Saturn makes as well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's yeah. pretty amazing, really. Nick Carstens. Oh, that was Venus. Yeah, oh, it, was Venus. it was Venus. Nick and I are going to be working on, uh, on another one of those because he wanted to show John more Martin. pictures. Yeah. yeah. I don't come. Uh, NASA can't see that the solar discharge, solar flares being They electrical. must know, man. Being yeah. electrical. They're, it's affect our, our electrical system. Really on kind of they're having Earth. satellites fly with it. Yeah. It's a front. They're, um, so, I mean, John Martino started his talk about the history of the cosmos by saying the whole thing is an unbelievably massive charged plasma. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So NASA must know this. Yeah. They're telling us something else. They're, the real they're, question they're, is why are they telling us? Why are they telling us? All in that geometry, yeah. like, you know, yeah. it's all there, isn't it? That's Ben Arn, that's the artist previously known as Nick Marchmont. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. <laughs> and that's a 6D cube, isn't it? It's a slice through a seventh dimensional hypercube. Oh, that's yeah. it, nearly right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which, which planet is the, is the hypercube connected to? Is it not Ooh. that one? Is um, it not? 
I think it's... it's Earth is connected with the cube. I, yeah, because yeah. they, the they, they do that symbolically, it. don't they? Yeah. Those black cubes, you've got one in um, the... Uh, going on the... What is it? The... Stop. Is it Scott on The United Nations, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. In their yeah. Fed prayer room. Yeah. In the way, in there, yeah. Which is quite that strange. That prayer room is a bit of a weird, weird... Have day. you been there? Or you no, I haven't, but I've read so much about it. Yeah. yeah. And all those funny shapes, it's all distorted, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they're really, they're really wrecking the geometry because they know the geometry works. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, let's say thank you again to these people. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very this is the dawning of the age of ten. Yeah. <laughs> they know. They know. They know. Golden hat. Yeah. Where is he? This man. Sit um, it. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free for a day. Well, I thought that went well. Yeah, it's nice. Rattled it on. Yeah, well, we're going to be setting up a tour of the UK now. I've got to be invited to Har, I've been invited to Penzance, so that's a start. <laughs>